Well, I first came before anybody else was here. I first came, I'll have to admit, I'm going to admit it now, in 1955. I was living in New York, and my first short story had been published, and I wanted to get to work on my first novel. So I wanted to find a place to go outside the city, because I don't like city. I don't like cities in the summer. So I didn't have the nerve to go to Europe, so I thought, ah, Mexico, that's right down there. So this, this is my first story in Secrets of San Miguel. At the Mexican government tourist office in Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center, I glanced through a list of towns to spend the summer writing my first novel. I read to San Miguel de Allende, cool mountains, 15,000 people, artist colony. It actually said artist colony. Breathlessly young, I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico City in the late 50s. It seemed uh, I was quite sure I could get somebody to drive me home. <laughs> I was in Mexico City, then Tosco, and then I went a roundabout way tr to try to save time to San Miguel. Our rickety bus careened along the high green plateau with the Sierras gliding the horizon in curving cordilleras. We began the long, steep, dramatic drop down the cobblestones of the Salida into San Miguel. Grand carved stone palacios and crumbling adobe haciendas, we dined at a huge communal wooden table. Guests and local Mexicans and expats, we all helped ourselves from the huge soap bo soup bowl that uh, centered the table. Mexicans have always made the world's best soup. It was, it was that easy to get to know people. This is what San Miguel looked like back then. San Miguel was totally black and silent at night. No street lights, only three cars. Occasionally, horses' hooves rang on cobblestones as a lone rider came through. I could hear my night visitor's boots clonk on the stones all the way up the hill. The tiny village stretched four blocks in every direction from the Hardeen, the main square, guarded by the parochia, its Gothic spikes spearing the mountain air. The town went from the Salida and San Francisco on the upside down to about the Monjas Hotel on the downside, the west. And then on the north, it went to Calzada de la Luz. And on the south, the last building in town was the Instituto Allende. Then there were cornfields, cornfields everywhere. Cornfields separated the Instituto from the uh, San, uh, San Antonio Iglesia. Nothing but cornfields. I've never seen so much green mice. Rain slammed into town and cascaded down the sloping streets a feet high. Wherever you were, you stayed. Fernando stayed the night. <laughs> Next afternoon in town, a sight from the Middle Ages, wailing and moaning and thumping whips. Sweeping down Calle San Francisco were the flagellantes, a hundred or so ragged devotees, whipping themselves on the back and legs till they bled. On their yearly pilgrimage to their church at a Totonilco, to scourge themselves of their sins. Sadly, their real sin was poverty. Many Mexicans were so poor, they wore wrapped pants and rubber tire sandals wrapped with cloth. Women with babies swathed in old black and white rebozos looked too thin to cradle an infant. Poor Mexicans were hungry. No work, no skills. No such luxury as jeans and t-shirts. Cows and pigs and turkeys lived in town with the resident chickens and burros. When one was butchered, you rushed to get the meat. Butchers had no refrigeration. You could live in San Miguel up until about 1980 on $2,500 a year. People would uh, work at some, you know, tawdry job who wanted to be serious artists and writers and then bring their $2,500 down here and they could live on it. 
And if somebody was fortunate enough to have $20,000 saved, you could get 12% interest or $2,500 a year and just live on and on and on. 12% was what was paid down here. A lot of people came down here. You could live on $2,500 a year. You could rent a mansion, a, say a mansion that went from Recreo up to Barranca for $25 a month. Because I had Pierre, Pierre de Latre, he was a, a writer from uh, San Francisco. He was known as the hippie priest of San Francisco until he quit to be a writer. But he was down here and he rented. Oh, he rented, he paid 75 a month for his mansion. Many interesting writers and artists were here. Charles Portis wrote True Grit in San Miguel. Mm -hmm. Vance Packard wrote The Hidden Persuaders and we all know ja Gary Jennings wrote Aztec. Uh, William Gaddis worked on Carpenter's Gothic here. Uh, Jack Kerouac and the Beats dropped in to visit their boozy mentor, Neil Cassidy, who, when he died drunk on the railroad tracks outside of town, your friend Peter O. Waller was called on to identify the body. Yeah. Hal Bennett, the Janae, the Janae of black writers, wrote Lord of Dark Places in San Miguel. Mm -hmm. And Clifford Irving, fraudulent autobiographer of Howard Hughes, hung around. <laughs> he was here. And you know where he got his stories? One of Howard Hughes's lawyers was a fellow named, lawyer named Ginsburg. He lived up on the hill a bit, and he would tell tales about the boss, and Cliff would sit around and listen. <laughs> Olivia Cole moved here after starring in Roots. Pulitzer Prize winning poet W.D. Snodgrass wintered in town, as did Donald Finkel and Constance Erdang, well-known poets. Beverly D'Onofrio came when riding in cars with boys became a Drew, Mer Drew Barrymore film. Mexican comedy star Cantine Floss was born here, and Diego Rivera nearby, in nearby Guanajuato. Muralist Alfredo Siqueiros helped found the Bayes Artes, the National Art School. All of those were people who were here early. San Miguel was very poor. They said that the rich were sitting in their family palacios starving on tortillas. There was no work in town, no work. Because this was a national monument town, industry was not permitted. So there's no work. And the poor had no work, no skills, no nothing. So uh, at any rate, the first groups that came were the American vets on the GI Bill because the GI Bill paid for them to study at the Instituto Allende and the Bayes Artes. That apparently engineered by Sterling Dickinson when he, was, uh, he belonged to the OSS right after the war. He was the one that apparently convinced the Army to pay for those art, stu uh, art studies down here. Then the second group that came was disabled American vets. That's because they, on their disability payments, they could live in Mexico. They couldn't live in the US. It wasn't enough money. So they came down here. And often, because they had that nice little income, they married very lovely Mexican young women and had families. American divorcees came because they could live down with children, because they could live down here on their uh, Alimony, the mm -hmm. alimony payments, not, not enough to live in the U.S. So the vets, the artists, and the mental disability World War II vets. This was a tiny town, and all the people were poor, mm -hmm. and there were, and all the Americans who, and you know, all the, all the artists and writers who were here were poor. Mm -hmm. You know, they were working artists. There was nobody with money. There was no such thing as rich houses, owned by people with money. They just weren't here. And when they started coming, they found that they could buy a mansion, like a mansion that went from Recreo up to Barranca, mm -hmm. that much land, for $25,000. Wow. And of course, they did. Mm -hmm. Everything was cheap, you know? Of course, everybody hung out at the Cucaracha. Yeah. Oh, the Cucaracha. You want me to tell you about the Cucaracha? Yes, yes. The Cucaracha was this marvelous seedy bar where Banamex is now, but it was not seedy looking. It had those high windows with the long curtains on the outside, just like now. 
and inside it was, you know, creaking apart red leather sofas. <laughs> and over here there'd be sort of an elegant wedding party coming from Mexico City to have a grand wedding fiesta out at a ranch. And over here there'd be a couple of drunks leaning <laughs> slouched against them. And in, in the back of the regular bar, there was a men's bar, just men. And at the bottom of the bar, there was a pissoir. A pissoir? A pissoir, a blue and white tile pissoir, so that they shouldn't have to move. And when the, we ladies were there, one of his waiters would escort us up to the ladies' room on the second floor and wait for us till we got out and put, put us back in the safe part. Everybody went there, the highest to the lowest. And the bartender was Chucho, the bartender and owner. And he let all the Americans run a tab. He was a very kind man. His sister was a cloistered nun. Yeah. And he, he uh, they all paid him back. He was never, never stiffed. It was kind of, he was, well, so the, the, the fiction editor of Esquire, a guy named Russ Tills, was down here, and he, he Russ, Russ liked to drink. And he'd overstayed his leave by quite a bit, so he thought, ah. He said, I'll write a uh, feature about the 10 greatest bars in the world. So he did, and he included the Cucaracha, <laughs> which, was, which, which was probably, it was a great bar. It used to be poor artists who could actually afford to live here and work seriously for a year, a year or more, mm -hmm. and many of them did. Mm -hmm. Now you have to have some money to be here. You know, the houses cost more. There are more houses, they're fancier, they're bigger. And it used to be nothing but artists and writers. Now it's lots of people with some money, lots of Americans with some money. People used to, Americans used to be somewhat afraid of this town because, you know, Mexico, Mexico's had its troubles and was continuing to have them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, I don't think it's more than 15 years ago when a, a big water pipe or maybe an oil pipe or something was blown up outside Quetzalcoatl. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a fear of revolutionary sentiment moving in up here. Well, instead, money moved in. Uh -huh. So that has changed the nature of the town. And of course, it's made everything much more expensive, and artists and writers have been frozen out just as they've been all over the U.S. I mean, you used to be able to be a poor writer in New York. Yeah. Oh. In the 70s, San Miguel had never heard jazz. Senor Marlowe, the Texas booze hound, brought his best Mexico City Conservatory students to San Miguel. Marlowe played Monk, Mustafa played Miles, Alberta was Casals combined with Dylan, and Roberto banged away. The look on Mexican faces, awed, astounded, they never heard such wild ranging rhythms. Those fleeting caroming notes Marlowe coaxed from the piano. Marlowe and gang played at Mamma Mia, for years. Marlowe tried with several women, but he could only make out with Ornitos Blanco. Tequila. Tequila. <laughs> One night performing at the piano, he slipped sideways to the floor and never got up, dead at 49. In 1970, the Quinta Loreto was built. And everybody that was a student, a teacher, an artist, a writer, stayed at the Quinta Loreto. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, I think I stayed for two months for $90, including two meals a day. <laughs> so there were people that called it the best deal on the Western Hemisphere. But the instructors stayed there, the students, everybody. All the rooms were filled at the Quinta Loreto. Mm -hmm. The hotel is owned by the, the three children of Musia Agundis, Augustine, uh, Chorhina, and Poncho. They own it as a family corporation. And they've done very well with it. Everything has been improved every year. And they are all college educated. They all speak English. And 20-some years ago, they all went out to Frylace, 
bought adjacent lots and built houses. Oh. So they're, you know, they're, they're smart people and they're educated okay. people. Oh. Every family is a dynasty, or as Octavio Paz said, every family is a mafia. Dr. Agundas wanted to set up his family. So first he built a restaurant, the restaurant at the uh, Quinta Loreto. He put his daughter, Musia, and her mother in there to learn how to cook for immense amounts of people. He took his 15-year-old daughter, Chelo, put her in the pharmacy to train her to be a pharmacist and a virtual doctor like he was. Mm -hmm. Both of those girls went to work at 15 mm -hmm. for the family. Musia's third husband was a retired geologist, Larry. She was married to one Mexican and two Americans. And uh, so Larry one day took Chelo from the pharmacy, Musia from the hotel, up, up to the top of the hill to see the sunset. They both started crying because they hadn't seen the sunset, sunset since they were 15 years old and their father put them to work. Wow. Isn't that something? Yes. And they adored their father. Everybody hung out at the Legion in the early 80s because it had a fine bar, great hamburgers, and a rock and country band. Mexicans packed it on Wednesday for bingo night. Bert, retired CIA, and painter Tish, his lady, sat with Conchita, and Tish cuddled Conchita's baby. Slightly dotty Lou Breck, called the oldest vet in the service, sat at the bar next to painter David Taylor. Lou handed David a carved antique pistol that looked as old as he did. David assumed it was unloaded. Very nice, said David, whose finger barely touched the trigger. The bullet ricocheted off the ceiling into Tish, who died instantly. Conchita caught her baby. Lou Breck left town for a month. No one was charged. Bert suffered horribly. David su suffered awful guilt. Bert was driving his van outside town when he was stopped by Federales. They pushed Bert out of the van and took off. Possibly they were thieves in stolen uniforms, but the police fondly did it too. A coffin for Tish was in the back. The 24-hour association buried her in another. This was 1969. All the Mexican papers were full of the scourge of the EPs coming to town. The EPs are invading Mexico. The EPs are taking over Mexico like they tried to do in the US. They thought the hippies were dangerous and that they were, <laughs> that they were an invading force. It was in all the newspapers. What happened was that the police chief and the mayor got drunk together on Saturday night in the Fragua. And the mayor finally convinced the police chief to go ahead and do this. 20 cops swarmed the Hardeen, grabbing long-haired guys, hauling their arms behind their backs, and marching them inside the jail. Young men emerged looking like scarecrows embarrassed and angry and running to their friends. Suddenly, two cops let go Craig and grabbed Melissa and hauled both into the car cell. You too, they said to Melissa, and push me away. Oh no, not a girl, people wail. They shaved the heads of two girls, possibly the only incidence of equal treatment in Mexico. A huge white man in a sombrero towering over the small brown townsfolk. Up close, those important, masterful black eyes of a psychoanalyst. He elbowed people aside till they made a path downhill for him, shouting all the way. I'm an American, he bellowed. I demand my rights, my civil rights. The cops shaved my son's head, my 14-year-old son. The small brown cops in front of him almost bowed before his grandeur, humbled by this great white man. Obsequious, sheepish grins, 
Meanwhile, four policia behind him grabbed his arms, hauled them behind his back, and bums rushed him into the car cell. It was not the same man who stumbled out of the car cell. The humble, frightened, lowly expression on the psychoanalyst's face was one he'd probably never worn. The fancy sombrero was gone. Many hippies left town, many tourists left town. Paul and I said goodbye to Craig and Melissa, who went back to college. The angry psychoanalyst and the APA complained to the lethargic embassy and wrote an article about it in the Sunday New York Times, August 10, 1969. When the mayor was asked why this happened, he replied, I'm the mayor. I don't have to explain. The police chief lost his job. Slowly, San Miguel became outwardly more civilized. Policia outrages from then on were against Mexicans, not foreigners. Foreigners only wanted to know San Miguel was paradise. 